This week's episode of the HP Outdoors Waterfowl Podcast is proudly brought to you by Lucky Duck. About the only creature they can't deceive is you. Lucky Duck is more than a brand, it's a lifestyle built around the subtle art of critter deception. While you're focused on the business end of your shotgun or rifle, know that they're completely focused on what matters most, you. Whether you're in the duck blind, dove field, predator stand, or chasing turkeys, they're confident their products will help you succeed. Check out their full lineup at luckyduck.com and keep up with them and the latest news by following them on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. You are listening to the HP Outdoors Waterfowl Podcast, Episode 95. This week on the show, we're joined by our good buddy, Barton Ramsey of Southern Oak Kennels and Cornerstone Gundog Academy, and we're talking intermediate training tips and techniques. All right, welcome to this, the 95th episode of the HP Outdoors Waterfowl Podcast. I'm your host, Josh Palm. And we are your on-demand audio source for all things waterfowl and waterfowl hunting. You can check us out at www.hpoutdoors.com. You can find our podcast across all of the various podcast catching uh, repositories out there. iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify, um, the Google Play stores, all all the good spots that you can find them. You can find our show. You can also check us out on social media. Facebook, Twitter, Instagram is primarily where we're at. If you're on Facebook, you can check us out at our listeners group, the HP Outdoors Waterfowl Podcast listeners group. Come in there and chat with myself a little bit and chat with uh, my co-host, Dan Hrushka. Dan, what's up? Not too much. It's uh, it's warm. This is my weather report. It's warm, kind of muggy here in PA. And uh, episode 95, so five weeks away from the big giveaway. But go ahead and hit them other sponsors real quick. Yeah, a couple the, that we'd like to thank this week. Uh, that are involved in that giveaway. And uh, one is Gunner Kennels. Gunner Kennels are engineered for your dog, designed for travel, and built for your peace of mind. The G1 Kennel has set a new industry standard and has put Gunner Kennels in a category all its own. Gunner was started to protect your pet, and it continues to be at the center of everything that they do. Gunner Kennels are dedicated to building the best and safest pet travel crate on the market. Man's Best Friends deserves Man's Best Kennel. Check out their G1 series of kennels and accessories at GunnerKennels.com. also want to thank... The newly released Bad Grammar Academy, the finest goose and duck calling instruction now available online with Scott Trinan, three-time world champion. Practice anywhere and anytime with online access to BGA. Give yourself the advantage and learn proven techniques to ensure the best chance to call birds right in your lap this season. Get started today at badgrammaracademy.com. Also want to take just a quick minute to thank Camp Chef, Black Rifle Coffee Company, Native Eyewear, Mount Airy Waterfowl Club, Warsaw, Virginia, and Cornerstone Gun Dog Academy. Thank you to all the companies that support this show. Uh, we encourage everyone to support them as you're able. Also, check out the discount codes that uh, some of these companies have been uh, awesome enough to offer for the HP listeners. You can save yourself 10% at Dunn Sporting Goods with using the discount code HPO. 15% off your order with Black Rifle Coffee Company using the discount code HP Outdoors. 10% off with White Rock Decoys using HP Outdoors. And a custom 737 duck or goose call engraved with the HP Outdoors logo by using the discount code HPO2018. Awesome savings there. Appreciate those companies for doing that and encourage everybody to check those out and um, take advantage of them. So this week, Dan, we got Barton back on the show and it was, we've been, it's been, I think um, it's been a couple of weeks. You know, we, we had Barton on when you were down there to pick up your father-in-law's dog and, um, you know, it seems like everywhere you turn around now, you're, you're seeing Southern Oak Kennel puppies and, um, you know, the, 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 the following of, in the, just the proven dogs that are coming out of his kennel are amazing. And, you know, obviously we're, we're big fans of what Barton's got going on. So we're, we're excited to get him back on him on the show this week and talk a little bit about sort of that intermediate level of training. So, you know, you're kind of in that six to 10 month period where, you know, you're kind of starting to get into some more advanced things. And, um, you know, starting to up the game a little bit and, um, you know, talking with Barton about some of the roadblocks that you might hit, ways to overcome them, things of that nature is going to be uh, real helpful, I think, for a lot of guys out there. 
Yeah, I always love talking to Barton just because he, you know, when you really get worried about some kind of training or you're really hitting a hitting a roadblock, you know, he he like you mentioned in the in the episode, he, he can step back and and really evaluate what the problem is and and break it down and and help people out. So that's always cool and always love talking to him, whether it be on social media or on here. And you know, just a, a great guy and a, a great thing he has going on, but. One thing, uh, just following up with you, and how's your ear infection going, bud? <laughs> um, it's still going. I went to the doctor, and I'm on my third different uh, antibiotic now that's not working. So I've got an appointment. Um, today's Tuesday. I've got an appointment with the specialist on Friday. So hopefully the specialist will get it squared away, and I'll get some relief. But, uh, yeah, it's been super annoying. I'm ready for it to be <laughs> be done with and um, and turn the page here. So. Yeah. So is this still a is this still a painful happening or is it just blockage now? No, it, it's not. It's not painful. Um, it's just it's just blocked. I mean, just think about having your one ear almost completely blocked for three weeks, and it's really hard to hear like conversation. Um, any kind of you know just background noise kind of takes over my hearing. So whenever someone talks to me, I, I really can't tell if they're talking to me or what's going on. Uh, so it, it's been very frustrating and. Um, yeah, like, you know, I can't tell you how many times, like even just around the house, my kid will say something to me and I'll be like, say again, like, what'd you say? Like, sorry, buddy. I'm, I can't hear. Like I'm freaking deaf. So, uh, all the more, all the more proof that I need uh, to ensure that you're wearing hearing protection in the field, because if this was a permanent situation that was due to muzzle blast and things like that, th- it would be, it would suck uh, because I have that blockage and I have like, I don't know, self-diagnosed uh, tinnitus or whatever it's called, like the, the ringing in the ears. Um, I got a little bit, I, I got a little bit of that going as it is. And it, it's, it, it comes and goes. Some days it's worse than others, but particularly with this blockage, it's, it's, it's intensified. Like I can hear it constantly pretty loud. So um, I need to get that relief. Cause it's like last night I was actually having trouble sleeping. It was so bad. So it's just very, very annoying. And I'm, I'm I'm ready to be done with this. I think my hearing's going a little bit. At least that's what the wife tells me. Definitely not hearing everything she talks about. Maybe that's just normal. Yeah, I mean, I it, could, it could be, you know. <laughs> but um, I can tell you right now, this is what I got going on is is not normal. <laughs> no, no, that's not fun at all. Nope. So yeah, uh, great great interview with Barton again. Like I said, tons of knowledge every time we talk to him. Some good stories to to boot, and uh, yeah, let's get after it. All right, let's do it. Welcome, Barton Ramsey, to the show. All right, we're excited to welcome back good friend of the show, the man behind Southern Oak Kennels, Cornerstone Gun Dog Academy, Barton Ramsey. Barton, what's up, man? Just hanging out. Been excited all day to talk to you guys and uh, do another episode. And excited to be in the air conditioner because it is definitely uh, still hot in the south. I think today the heat index is around 105. The humidity was about 4,000 percent. Yeah, so, buddy, it's, it's been it's been brutal lately. And uh, to say that you've been busy and and having your hands full and working is uh, probably an understatement. Got things going on, and uh, you know, I, I, before I ask you about some of those things, I got to tell you, man. Recently in our in our listeners group, Dan had asked the question, how many people in there had Southern Oak Kennel Pups? And I was floored by the number of people in the group that um, that have pups from Southern Oak Kennels. And, you know, that's that's just a tip of the cap to you and just kind of proof proof in the pudding that uh, you all are doing good things down there. So talk to us a little bit about what's been going on, man. You know, we had the um, you know, we had Scott trying it on last week, had the, the launch of Bad Grammar. I've been seeing that all over the uh, the Internet's. And uh, yeah. looks like every looks like that's been uh, doing really well. And of course, you got Cornerstone, and you know I see people every day. It seems like, hey, I'm putting down my deposit with Southern Oak Kennels for whatever litter in like 2025. Um, so it seems like there's no uh, <laughs> no shortage of wait yeah. list at Southern Oak Kennels. So tell us how it's going, man. It's going well. It's been a really really busy summer. The idea for Bad Grammar was sort of birthed in the late spring. So to say we like just straight knocked it out of the park quick and that's not to say we did a great job i think we did but i'll leave it to the, the clients to judge that but 
like as far as getting it done, it was like, hey, Scott texted and said, what do you think about this idea? And we tweaked a few things about it. And I was like, let's do it. And this was probably in early May and maybe late April. And we launched it August 1st. So that was filming it and everything. Hmm. So that was a whirlwind to get done. Super fun to work with Scott Trinan. Uh, I learned so much just like listening to him make those videos and I uh, kept wanting to pick up the calls that were sitting on the table and just try it right then. And that's been super fun. The launch was successful. And man, I was blown away too to see there were like 140 people in HP Outdoors that bought um, that bought uh, Bad Grammar signed up. You know, it's not it's 40 bucks. So it's not like a huge investment, but even still, for those people to take time to go sign up, give them credit card and you know, take a part out of their day just to learn how to blow calls from a guy that's in my mind legendary uh, i was i was blown away super cool um and uh yeah so i was saw the post about southern oak i saw dan post that and i was like oh boy this is gonna be interesting uh <laughs> but man i was loving all the pictures it's i mean there's just a picture of my sok dog which was cool i took a bunch of them to use for our instagram to expand for the content <laughs> and uh but it was good i think there's, there's twofold there like number one you know, being a part of this podcast has been spectacular for all my companies. You know, like we, we feel blessed to be a, partnered with HP and we have been with you guys from, I feel like pretty early on in yeah, the beginning no doubt. and, uh, and, to uh, you know, see, it, see it go strong and then lull for a while and then come back like just straight with a vengeance. Uh, it's been really fun. And so I think that's been good for all of my companies, but at the same time, we push all of our Southern Oak people to HP listeners group too, because we hear from them all the time. Like the people that are in both are constantly telling us like Southern Oak society, Southern Oak kennel society and HP outdoors are the only two places I even feel like are worth getting on Facebook for and that sort of stuff. And I'm always humbled by that. Um, but I definitely, definitely see it in y'all's group and Dan and Josh, you both have done a great job maintaining that group and, you know, it's not easy. Some people, I think, think it's just like sit back and relax, but it's constantly having to monitor. It's like a hall monitor sometimes. Yeah. Uh, but uh, it's been super fun. Good group of people. And then Cornerstone, it's been really awesome too. Uh, we filmed some new videos this summer, some new training videos. Uh, we're still launching some. We launched that funny uh, Labrador Retriever Planet Earth spoof. And uh, that went over <laughs> really well. I was shocked. Like just... You know, when you post something that's kind of goofy, I'm the serious guy, believe it or not, when it comes to making content. Like when we make stuff, I'm like, let's not do a funny picture or like a funny video. Like, let's make them all. And those guys were like, we have to do this video. And I was like, whatever. I'm dressed up in like British attire that's tweed. And it was like 90 out <laughs> sweating. And, you know, Aaron's giving me all these directions. And he's like, look at the camera and wink. And I'm like, this is the stupidest thing I've ever done. And about a week before it came out, he texted me. He was like, this might be what I'm the most proud of in all my accomplishments. <laughs> Aaron Hitchens did the, he did the voiceover. This Canadian talks like a normal, you know, North American did that first accent. Um, and uh, it's been, it has a hundred, over a hundred thousand organic views. You haven't put a dollar behind it. <laughs> and, uh, in like 30 countries i've just been dying just laughing people have made gifs out of that week which is really <laughs> awful and really funny and anyway it's been, it's been a busy summer but i don't know about you guys i'm i'm sitting here like just itching to go hunt stuff now i'm like all right all the fun time's over it's time to go have some real fun go shoot some stuff so it's been fun been busy and now i'm ready to ready to crank back up with some waterfowl yeah, I think I made a post about that too. Just super, super itchy trigger finger and getting ready to get back in the field. But, you know, I think um, the little bit of time that I've spent around Aaron when I was down there, he is a fun dude. So no matter how serious you want to be, I think you're going to, you're going to have a good time no matter what. I mean, that guy's a, he's a character and uh, definitely, definitely cool to be around. But, you know, something else I was thinking about, you know, when you were talking about kind of, the life the life cycle of HP and how we started out and slowed down and and uh, came back with a vengeance as you said but how cool is it to you know kind of meet new people even if it's online and then and and I'm speaking 
right now as far as Vandekamp. You know, he he's real active in our group, and then he goes through and comes down with me to pick up a dog. And and then this past weekend, he goes down and he picks up his puppy Tex. And I think you know, just to be on your end of that is really cool to see just the the growth of your company and and new customers like that. And then pretty much, I mean, new friends and new family is how you treat them. So I think that has to be a, a really special thing that you get to you get to end up watching the puppy grow and and go through cornerstone and everything that's just it it really is um it really is cool and that that brings me to you know the the sitka film that just came out and i I forget the wording on it but it you know you mentioned something that the the dogs give you a lot more than what you give the dogs and and that's really uh just the the respect the respectful undertone of that comment really proves just how passionate you are about what you do. And, and I don't know if people really understand how awesome of an operation you have, but, um, definitely, definitely shown through on that video. Yeah, I appreciate that. And, and man, I think David Vandekamp is probably the, like the primo example here. And there, there are a lot of other examples, but obviously a bunch of your listeners, especially folks in the HP group are familiar with David and, you know, he heard about us through the HP group, through you guys, and then rode down here with you, Dan, to pick up your father-in-law's pup, Boo, spent the weekend, had already put a deposit down on a pup, so was super excited. That litter didn't work out. He switched to a different litter, which is a phenomenal litter, I think. And then he just, uh, then he just flew down here and picked his pup up and had a weekend with a lot of clients and folks. We went training. And like that bro is like a friend, you know, like he's, I considered David a friend. We went to church together Sunday and he rode home with my, I have a special needs son named Liam and he pitched a fit all day in church and screamed the whole way home. I felt awful. He was kicking David's seat. David's just like, I could tell he was making his teeth hurt. And, uh, <laughs> man, it was, uh, it was, it was interesting, but I consider that bro like a close friend now. And that, there's two aspects of my job that make it awesome. Number one, I get to hang out with dogs all the time. Uh, like just, I don't know, they make your life better. Obviously, they just, if you're, if I'm having an awful day and come down here and just let a few dogs out, they're jumping all over me and they're excited. I'm like, all right, cool. This is, this is better. They just make you feel better. Uh, and they're super fun. And then number two, I get to meet like some of the coolest people. And it's tempting to say like in the industry, you know, I do get to meet some awesome people like doing the Sitka film, you know, and, and work with people who are awesome. But like David Vandekamp, like he has a job and loves water. He's not working in the industry. He's just a, a bro that has shares some interest with us. And those guys become friends and there's countless of them. And uh, man, that's the, that's the best part. Just being able to call those guys friends and say through all this, through those guys, just heading down here through Facebook, through HP, through Southern Oak Health Society, blah, blah, blah. It's uh and it's been super fun, super fun. You know, I if I remember this right, and correct me if I'm wrong, Dan, I think this the we, the hands of fate started turning for Vandekamp because didn't he win a Cornerstone Gun Dog Academy giveaway that we had done at one point? Yeah, I think he did. I think he did. That was kind of it. Yeah. And that, then he's like, "Oh, I gotta get a, I gotta get a Southern Oak Kennel dog." Yeah, yeah. And uh, yeah, it went from there. The the whole thing, he won that, and then he's like, I don't know how I'm going to get my wife to approve this. So then he he put a Facebook page, or his Facebook profile picture was a dog, and everyone from the HP group started commenting on it, and then his wife was like, what is going on? <laughs> and then finally, finally he uh, showed her enough videos and stuff that she's like, all right, let's do it. So he started saving up and uh, and got it done, so... Oh, I know he's he's in love with that dog, and I know his kids are over the moon right now. So, all good stuff. So, 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 go back talk talk a little bit about the uh, the Sitka film and release. I mean, just a beautiful piece of art that uh, Kana Kana Outdoors put together, and you know, Brad was Brad was a vital part in the production of that, I believe. So, maybe speak to that whole whole adventure, man. Really, I mean, it started a, lo- a long time ago as a conversation um, with Ryan Batham and uh, Jonathan Hart and 
I, it was it was really cool. I'll, I'll tell you like a, a part that no one no one really knows other than like a very close inner circle. There was a conversation about using Mike Kennel as sort of a, a subject for the film when they released the timber pattern. You guys may remember that it was a huge deal. Um, mm-hmm. And so when they did that, um, they didn't use my kennel and they kind of, and it wasn't, they just had other plans, you know, but from the outside looking in me and the guy that were pitching it, uh, we were both really disappointed and we weren't mad. It was just like, shoot, that would have been really cool. But it's really cool to look back now and say, man, the waiter thing is such a better fit even because, you know, hunting and water dogs are almost necessary. You know, it's just such an important part of it. Such a cool combination. So they reached out early Early on, Ryan Backham did, and I uh, was like, man, we were thinking about using you uh, for the part of the waiter launch, and we're going to do three, four, five different films, but we want to do one kind of feature short film uh, just about you and dogs and all that. And I was like, man, let's, let's rock it. And uh, it went from there, and it was super fun to do. Working with Ben Potter and all the guys, Mather uh, was with us. Mather is a great dude. He films the Slade Northwest uh, stuff, like pretty much on his own. Um, Mather McCallers is his name, and he, he does all of all of the Slade Northwest stuff, which is super awesome. Um, and he, he was there with us for a, a bit of it. Drew was there from Cana. Jim Potter, Salt of the Earth, great guy, and they just knocked it out of the park, I think. We filmed in the Timber in Arkansas at uh, Five Oaks. Uh, we filmed in the marsh and in the uh, flooded corn at Hooray. Had a like phenomenal time at Hooray uh, as well. And then um, we came here and filmed the rest of it at, at SOK and uh, stood out in the rain for a long time training dogs and making videos. And man, it was uh, it was unreal fun to do. Um, there were awesome parts. There were difficult. You know, just out there just trying to get ducks to do it right. You know, with the cameras and. Uh, you know how it is. You bring cameras out there, and it just uh, it just gets you know it gets the ducks are like, oh, there's cameras, or we're going somewhere else. You know, <laughs> you put the cameras up, and the ducks just drop in the hole. So you know, same thing like when you go to pick the decoys up, and they all drop in. You know, uh, so it uh, it's been a been a whirlwind, and then it was you know waiting on it to be edited. Those guys score their own music, so like they did all of that. Every bit of the production was Drew and Ben. And uh, mm. Sitka waiting on Sitka. Yeah, I I've been sitting on it. Like I, it was sort of mean. Brad Christian um, from Sitka sent it to me without any comment other than don't share, and a link to a Vimeo file. And it was still kind of being edited. And I was driving my whole family to the beach, and I couldn't watch it. And I had like four <laughs> hours to go, and I was like, I gotta pull over. I just gotta pull over. I gotta do this stuff. And that, and then we had to wait another month before it was like officially launched, you know. And so I've been, I've been pumped, and it's been great feedback. I think, I think everyone that has dogs can resonate, you know. I mean, just the joy you get from hunting with a dog. Some of my favorite hunts I say in the film are just me and the dog, and I mean that because you don't ever really have to go by yourself, you know. You can go out and and the dog's with you, and you don't feel like it because hunting hunting alone, I feel like can be great, but I really enjoy the social aspect of, um, of waterfowling. So I don't deer hunt. And, uh, and so man, just being able to have a dog out there is really fun and, and knowing that they contribute to conservation and to actually, you know, taking game and, and making sure that you retrieve it and are able to eat it and process and all that super, super fun. It was fun to show all that stuff. I think people really resonated. The response has been overwhelming the last, uh, last couple of days. Yeah. That's, that's a great, great film. Now does, does Connaught, do they do their own music too? I know that Slade, they, they produce their own music. Yeah. And yeah. Ben did that. all that music for the whole waiter launch. So if you That's really listen to all the films, like there's a film that does that they show the the actual like um you know what they mean by lifetime like the replacement value the the service film, then the music for that is so spot on. They actually did a short little trailer for my film that was released yesterday, and the music for that is um, just awesome, very similar but just different, you know, different enough. And uh, then. They, they've done like a stoke reel where the waiters are just getting blasted by cold air and ice and heat and 
sticks and blah, 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 blah. And, it, and all the music Ben did, and he's really good at it. Uh, Drew does a lot of it too. Drew does a lot of music stuff. And then, uh, of course, yeah, it's phenomenal. I couldn't believe it when they told me that. I was like, where did you find this song? And they're like, dude, you made it. I was like, are you serious? Like, I had no idea. Yeah, I think that adds so much to their film. It, it adds, adds so much to their film because yeah, you yeah, don't, they you know don't the have feel. to fit. Yeah. Yep, exactly. And you don't fit the video to the music. You you put the music to the emotion to the film, and that's it's it, it's just incredible. So yeah, yeah. I wanted to, I wanted to actually bring up something about this film because the first time I saw it, um, I, when I watched it all the way, I watched it all the way through in completion, and for whatever reason, <laughs> like that that last scene where I believe it's red just hits that pond, like going full, you know, just full send. Like it, like I'm not lying to you. It gave me chills. And like the way that I would equate it to is like, if you're watching, if you've ever had the experience of like, you're listening to someone sing and it's like, you know, you're just like, like, this is amazing, right? Like this person has a gift. And like, you know, I watched that dog hit the water and I immediately, I was like, I I picked up my phone and I and I messaged Barton. I was like, dude, like that just gave me chills. Like, holy smokes! And uh, yeah, something about the way they did that ending, man. It's oh just, man, oh. it's amazing, and it's just it's so cool because you know it's like it, like what honestly I was thinking about this in my drive home today because I knew we were going to talk to you. I was thinking about this in the sense that you know that dog in that moment like is living life. Like I wish I could live every single day. Like that dog is just attacking the moment and, and would, wouldn't be, wouldn't rather do anything else in that moment. Like it was just full on, like everything, you know, every fiber of his, yeah. of his being was going there and was just take, you know, there was no mountain too tall. Like it was going right. And you know, the way that you narrate that video and it's like, you know, when you, and it says, you know, just, you know, just say when, after you've watched it and you think back about it, I'm like, golly, I mean, that is, that couldn't be more true. Like that dog is just like, yeah. just tell me when to go. And it is on. And that's it. And I'm just like, man, I wish I could, you know, those days when you wake up at like five in the morning and it's like workout day and you're just like, yeah, I'm going to go back to sleep today. Like, those, you know, <laughs> a, dog, a dog like that doesn't have that off switch. I mean, it's on all the time. And, uh, all it, the time, it's yeah. just one of those things where it's like, I found it very inspirational, you know? And I was like, man, that, that was just really well done. And, yeah, just yeah. cool stuff. That's good to hear, man. I appreciate that a lot. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, when I come down to the kennel, the dogs are never like, hey, just let me sleep in today, <laughs> especially Red. <laughs> if I walk out right now, that sucker, and, and Dan has seen all that firsthand. When I walk out right now, he is ready to roll, man, like ready to roll. Uh, and, you know, he does turn it off in the house, but you're right, out in the field, he, he is engaged 110% all the time. So I was really glad they captured that. The part where I talked about um, other people's puppies, um, that's the part that, that got me, which I knew, you know, like I knew I said all that I said, but when I just was like, you know, I, I fed these pups their first meal and I really did. I take them out for a little walk in the grass and they all, I mean, Dan, you've seen it. They just follow you around like little ducks in the yard. And uh, <laughs> then the next time I see them, usually they're, you know, they're grown and we're hunting. And I'm just like, holy cow. Like I, I helped uh, one of my moms, like I pulled, <laughs> it's gross, but like a lot of these pups, I pulled them out of their, the sack, the birthing sack, because the mom was, you know, tired and didn't do it. And I rubbed them with a the towel until they started breathing. <laughs> and then, the next time you see them, they're picking mallards up. It's nuts, you know. It's just nuts that that process. And so when when I said that, I had to stop for a second. I was like, "Geez, I'm not crying. You're crying." You know? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think it uh, your 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 love and and passion for the dog shows too. Because if anyone puts up a Instagram post with the dog, you you usually don't say too much except their name in all caps. Whether it doesn't matter who it is, you know, Rue or what, you know, whatever it is, but you know, you just you know all the dogs' names, you know the the owners, and you know, just fully invested, which is it's just awesome. So I appreciate that guy's thing. Love, Love it. it. Thanks. So let's you know before we get into uh, uh, training, you know, we did a lot of pup, a lot of puppy stuff, and one question, and I don't know if we've covered it before or not, but one I I told you I was going to ask you that I see you answering all the time, but your thought on callers and why you do what you do. Yeah. So there's two answers there. There's callers, like a flat collar that like 
is leather or like a buckle, you know, just a collar. And I'm actually not like against collars. I just personally don't like them. Like the same reason I don't like turtleneck sweaters. And I just don't like the way dot Labradors look in collars. I, I like the just straight, I guess, naked lab look. Um, if they can get hung and stuff, the biggest thing for me is my dogs, like my dogs are out running four times a day and then they get worked several days a week on top of that. And almost every single one of those times they get in the water. So if you've got a flat collar on and you're getting in and out of the water in the heat like that, you get hot spots, they stink, they just get matted up under it. And so I just don't, don't like them at my kennel. If you have a place where your dog is might like might be at risk for actually running away, then having a, a collar with your name and number on it, that's a good idea. Um, not a bad thing. Now, the second question, which you may have been alluding to, is e-collars. I mean, is that a we can go down that route if you want to. It's totally up to you. No, just no. Let's let's we'll stay off of that because that's a whole other conversation. But you do use the slip leads, which I saw you use at one time as a kind of a correction because uh, one wouldn't listen, but. Um, maybe just go into that. You do, you do utilize that in certain situations. Yes. Yes. I use the leads for sure. All the time. I use one today. I let a dog out in the parking lot, uh, with his owner, with, with one of Brad's dogs. And I wouldn't worry about her running away or anything like that. Um, but, uh, I just didn't want to risk it, you know, and that's a smart thing to do. Uh, but for training, we use, you know, the cornerstone method where, so when it comes to training dogs, there's lot, you know, there's lots of different philosophies behind it. There's positive reinforcement. Tell the dog to sit, they sit, give them a reward. You know, that's really simple. Um, there's negative reinforcement, which is where you reinforce a command by removing something, the dog, um, we're removing a stimulus, in other words. So we can get into that philosophy. It's a lot of talk to. There's positive punishment. And there's negative punishment. Um, negative reinforcement would be like force fetch, where you put something the dog doesn't like, and then you remove it to reinforce something the dog is supposed to be doing. So you pinch their ear, and when they do what you want, you remove the pinch. Punishment is like, you know, the dog uh, breaks, and you grab the lead and rip the dog back or you know that sort of thing you add punishment uh um negative punishment is you remove something the dog wants to keep the dog. punishment is not necessarily a bad word it just means you're trying to get the dog to not do something anymore does that make sense reinforcement means you're trying to get the dog to do something so if the dog's jumping on you and you take a step toward it and say no you're adding in something the dog doesn't like, that's punishment, and you're adding it so it's positive in order to get the dog not to do that anymore. Does that make sense? So um, slip leads, I think dogs learn a lot better with positive reinforcement, which is treats, and, and then reward as a retrieve or just petting, whatever. So for us, like let's just take um, somebody mentioned in HP about um, recall. The dog doesn't know what it means to come, right? Well, you're not going to teach a dog that with a leash. Um, you can reinforce it, but you're not going to. You, you can you can strengthen the command, put parameters around the command, but it's a lot easier to teach uh, the command with um, reward. So what we do, and we did this with one of Boo's littermates uh, who's still here, Ray. You know, Ray's out in the yard. I call Ray to me, and I just kind of wait. And if she runs toward me, I give her this, like, good girl, good girl, good girl, you know, blah, blah, blah. And I've got treats in my hand, and then I reward the dog. Um, if she doesn't come to me, I don't just keep on calling her until she does, because then she's just learning she can ignore me. Once that I'm confident that when I call the dog, she knows what it means to come to me, then I'll put a leash on the dog. And if she's sitting down, I'll call her to me. And if she doesn't, I'll give a tug, because she knows what it means now. Um, that's how we use slip leads. And we do the same thing with heel work. So, um, anyway, yeah. Mm. Yeah. All mm. makes sense. Yeah. So as, makes sense. as Dan mentioned, you know, we've talked a little bit about, you know, from the puppy stage and, you know, as we were, as you were just talking, um, I went back and looked and, uh, you were on episode eight of the show, zero, like eight single digits. So it's been a while and it, you know, that was a long episode, almost two hours. But, um, I think one of the things that I'm, I'm curious about, and you know, maybe this ex is explained a little more in, in more detail in Cornerstone, but let's say, 
you know, someone's got a dog that maybe they're new to Cornerstone or they're new to training in general. And how, what, what would be some of the signs that, that, that a guy should look for to know that his dog is ready to move to sort of like that intermediate step? Like, are there things that he should absolutely have command of? Are there things that like, you know, if he doesn't quite have that completely, it's still okay because that's going to develop or, you know, sort of how does someone know to say other than like, you know, they're following along the training modules one by one, you know, if someone's got a dog in there and saying like, Hey, I think he's ready. Let me, let me pick up cornerstone. Um, you know, how does someone know when their dog's sort of ready to kind of take that next, that next step into the progression? Yeah, it's a great question. And every dog, it's like the intro to our brand anthem. Every dog learns differently, right? So reading your dog is super important, but there are a couple concrete. Like you're not ready to transfer into intermediate work until your dog has his or her adult teeth. Um, you know, they can't do retrieving work. You don't need to do whole conditioning. You don't need to be working on big time retrieving stuff and the dog's teeth start falling out. They don't want to pick anything up, mm. right? Yeah, good point. Um, that, that's a generally a pretty cool time frame because that happens. Most Labradors have their adult teeth by six months and by six to eight months, they typically, um, they typically are mature enough to like, so puppies, five, six minutes, sometimes two minutes and they're done. You know what I mean? They're like, Oh, a butterfly, blade of grass, poop, you know, right. deer poop. I'm out. Um, but, they get to a certain stage where they start to mature. And you got to think it's not like a six month old kid. These dogs are growing at a rate of about seven of our years to one of theirs. So, um, you've got a, a four or five year old, this ready to start kind of pre-K, you know, then you can really start working on some stuff. Cause now they're paying attention a little bit. You also run into things that you see with dogs that different, you know, terrible twos, that sort of thing, different for every dog. But once they're paying attention a little bit more, you can hold their focus. They've developed some size, uh, and some maturity and they have their adult teeth then it becomes more about just reading your dog and knowing where you are in your training. Now, the cool thing is, um, the cool thing is with Cornerstone, we have a general roadmap that will take you through the progression your dog is supposed to be on, as well as a daily lesson planner and a very thorough explanation to how to train your dog with that lesson planner so that you move through each step consecutively. Does that make sense? So if you've gotten to where your dog's pretty good at this one thing, then let's, you know, move it to the beginning of your training session. And in the middle of your training session, let's add something totally new, pick from these things and start working on that. Right. Mm. Um, does that make sense? Totally. Yep. Cause I mean, I feel like, I feel like it would be an easy thing to fall into if you didn't have some sort of roadmap or planner to help you, slow down because I feel like I, I mean I just feel like for me it would be really hard to kind of throttle back and not not want to push it you know I mean everyone's got the dream of having this amazing dog you know doing all of these things but a lot of guys probably don't realize the work and the effort and the time that it takes to build that and I think for me it would be really hard to say like okay am I moving too quickly here like am I doing more harm than good you know that that kind of mentality would be uh would be tough for me to kind of deal with if I didn't have something to kind of guide me Man, yeah, yeah, for sure. Man, I think slow. <laughs> Talked to a guy today. I was like, man, if if I could get people to quit doing the like stuff that you should be doing with your eight month old with their eight week old puppies, it would really help us out <laughs> because just getting people to slow down. And I get it. You got one dog, and you've been so excited to get this dog that you know you can't wait um, to get going and get moving, all that stuff. Um, but man, you just got to take it slow. You got to take it slow. You got to you gotta eat the elephant one bite at a time and quit trying to knock off these big chunks real young. And because people will, will do a whole, whole lot um, early on and not realize you're going to have to go back and redo all of that when the dog goes through you know, maturity phase. Hmm. Yeah. And let's talk, you know, I, I have one of the lesson planners up and, you know, just talking about the maintenance of, of these skills and, or the drills that you do and acquisition and fluency and then maintenance again. And in between every single one is obedience. And I don't think, I think that that gets missed so much, you know, as far as if, if you don't have, if you don't have that to remind you, then you could just go boom, 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 try all these different drills. And then that obedience gets lost somewhere in between that. 
yes. So what a lot of people do is they, and this is not to bash other trainers, but a lot of people have a lot of dogs in training and, or they're just in a hurry and they think the most important thing that they can do is the retrieving work. So they pull a trailer out to the field, they pull a dog out of the trailer, they run uh, a couple of retrieves with that dog, a couple of different drills with that dog, and then they move to the next dog, right? And what do you think happens when you take that dog to the duck blind? Like, you still have to get out of the truck, put out the decoys, brush in the blinds. Maybe the dog's in the truck that whole time, but then you get the dog out, you still got to wait till shooting hours. Then you got to wait till the birds start working. And man, the, th- those dogs just learn like my whole life is about retrieving and nothing else matters. And I don't have to sit still. And, um, whereas for, for us, for our program, what we've learned is, uh, my mentor once told me, and I think I may have said this on the show that 90% of retrieving problems are obedience problems. That has proven to be the most true statement. Um, I'll have guys call, even my guys, Hey, we're having trouble with this dog. He's doing this. We're trying to fix it with, you know, running these drills. I'm like, no, 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 no. Just go back and just take the retrieving out totally for a week and just work on recall. And sure enough, five days later, like, man, dog's doing great. You know, it's just, it was an obedience issue. So for us, it's, it's always going back and doing even quick. It's not like you have to do 20 minutes of obedience between that stuff. It's just, Hey, you know, even for us, like if we're running a drill that has marks off of the winger or the Versa launcher, when I go to reload, I do heel work with the dog the whole way out to reload it. So with a young dog, like an intermediate dog, and they're learning how to walk mark off a winger, I'll put two wingers out, shoot a mark, shoot another mark. And then when I go reload for the next dog or for that dog again, I'll walk the dog at heel and we'll do healing circles and squares and reverse heel and sit and stop and recall all the way out there and all the way back, you know, rather rather than just waste that moment putting them up. Um, So I think it's imperative to do that uh, obedience all the way through your training session for sure. And I think not even throughout it, but I mean, you start with it when you, when you walk out and you open up, this is the one thing that just absolutely blew my mind. You walked out, you opened every door to your kennel and what didn't matter which side you were on. And then you step back and they're all sitting there waiting for their name to be called. And if they broke or if they didn't listen, you just left them in there. So that's their, I want to say punishment, but I mean, that's how you take, take away, you know, if they're not obedient take to you. Away so, the reward. To take away the reward of not getting to go out and play. And, and, uh, I'm just sitting there and I did, I felt bad because I'm like, oh, they want to go so bad and maybe they just misheard him or something. You know, I'm, I'm getting all the feels involved and stuff, but I'm like, nah, he, you know, he knows what he's doing. So, and it was, uh, you know, that was eye opening. And that's, I was going to say, that's one thing, like when I had my dog and, and Kimber's nine now, like I've mentioned many times, but, you know, I had no idea what I was doing. So like you said, like we'll get out in a, in a cut cornfield, start setting up decoys. Half the time she's, you know, sniffing something she shouldn't be, or she's just running around sniffing stuff 300 yards away. And then I have to call and scream and, and it's a pain. So definitely, you know, I've learned my lesson the hard way, but I was ignorant as far as training goes. So, um, yeah, definitely a, a a big lesson to be learned as far as obedience is concerned. Yeah. And we say it all the time. Obedience is a lifestyle. It's Mm -hmm. not just something that you do at the end of the training session or at the beginning, it's a total lifestyle. So it starts out with, you know, when the dog eats, when the dog goes through the door, um, you know, sitting before those things, loading up, you know, how the dog responds when people, when new people are around, you know, just, just really honing in on all that. And then you stick with it. Yeah. That actually happened. Um, Sunday, Sunday, I gave Howell the day, the afternoon off. He's been working his tail off. And I came down to let the dogs out and, you know, I'm letting them out. Open, I open every door as you said, and then I back up and I call them out one by one. And it's harder on the girl side because my girls stay two for kennel. They just do better that way socially. And, uh, I go back and, I call one of them and, and I look on the other end and here comes one sneaking out, you know? And so <laughs> I, I, you know, I didn't, I didn't have to like rough her up or anything. It's just, no, come back. Of course you're hoping the rest of them don't come busting out at that moment. Cause then it's just, there's no, there's no recovery. You know, that does happen. And I'm not perfect. Neither are the dogs, but I'm like, no, you know, get back in there. I won't say any names. And, 
she goes back in. And then tonight, uh, I came out, let every, I let everyone out 20 minutes before we hopped on the phone and I opened all the doors and, uh, I made sure she was last, you know, dead last. Um, but she sat there staring at me, never moved a muscle. And, uh, like good, good, good girl. You know, I'll let her go first tomorrow. Um, <laughs> so they definitely they learn that way on occasion. But it's a it's a standard that you can't you can't let the standard go. You know, and that's hard. We had a guy with us training the other day. We we're talking about intermediate dog work. We had a guy training with us the other day with a younger dog, and the dog um, broke. And man, it's a it's a drive to get out there. You've set everything up. You're working with this intermediate dog in group work and the dog breaks and we just said hey look we're going to run like we're going to run like eight eight dogs through this setup and your dog is going to have to sit there and watch this is what's best for your dog and if he breaks one more time he's going to get no retrieves today i can literally drove all the way out there he didn't break anymore he actually got the retrieves and crushed the setup but and, and the the guy that owned the dog totally agreed he's like oh yeah i'm not sending him and can you imagine the patience <laughs> it takes to drive 45 minutes Bring your side by side. Help the guy set the whole thing up. Reload the wingers constantly. Like nothing but help. And because your dog breaks one time on like second or third dog, you know, you, you don't get the, to go. the chance of not going. Yep. Yeah. Do you imagine that? Like the patience that takes. I think people are unwilling to do that, and that's what leads to dogs that are impatient and, and unsteady. Yeah, I, I I don't have any doubt. And it's funny. It's it's it's. I'm, I'm literally thinking about this question I'm going to ask you and you like almost took the words out of my mouth with, with bringing up patience and I'm, cause I'm looking through the intermediate, um, you know, courses here and you know, I'm looking at the different things and, uh, you know, we're, you're talking like whistle stops, directional training, marking, marking, things like that. And I, I, I kind of wonder, you know, for guys that are, they're getting into this, you know, at this point you're in the media intermediate stuff. You're, you're, you know, I'd like to think that you're pretty committed to the deal. Right. And, you know, right. And if, yeah. you, if you don't have patience, you're going to struggle. Right. I mean, it's going to be a, a test mm-hmm. of your patience. Um, in your opinion, what, which, which, which of these steps or which, you know, a couple of these steps are going to test your patience a little more than maybe some of the others. Are there things that guys can anticipate knowing that like, okay, going into learning this skill, it's going to be a challenge and it's going to take time. And like, you know, if they, if they get, if they get their mind right going into it, perhaps it'll help them better deal with it when the dog's not responding or, you know, not getting it quite like you'd hope they would. Um, that would sort of help them kind of work through that and just kind of think to themselves, okay, like I knew this was going to happen and just kind of stay the course. Yeah, Man, so all the dogs are different, but there are a few, there are a few. So, um, cold conditioning can either be so easy or like make you just want to quit. You know, like just that's, that's the process of getting your dog to be cool with holding a dummy in his mouth and not dropping it. Right. So delivery to hand, we have a, a long process in cornerstone. I think it's seven or nine videos or something just to walk through that whole thing. Right. Um, and that, um, that can be, uh, really trying, you know, people will be like, man, we were doing great. We got to this and I'm ready to give up. You know, <laughs> we've, we've definitely seen it. Um, so, um, then, um, then I would say when you're, when dogs get to like this, okay, everyone thinks they have like the smartest puppy in the world. I'm just going to say that. Vandy can't, your dog's not smarter than other people's puppies. You know, like pe- <laughs> people, people get their puppy home and all the puppy knows to do is like survive. And like when you, when you love this dog and feed this dog and become this dog's world, um, then the dog does everything you say. Do you know what I mean? Like they just love to do that. They're puppies. And then all of a sudden it's like this light switch flips and they get a mind of their own Hmm. and it happens at different ages. Sometimes it's four months. Sometimes it's not until seven or eight months. Sometimes it's 12 months. And then they're like, I don't, I don't have to listen to David Vandekamp. <laughs> you know, like this dude actually makes me do things I don't really want to do, like come here and sit. And I really just want to go sniff that poop over there and that tree and <laughs> pee on that flower. 
And man, that, that is a time I tell my trainers, I'm like, Hey, we're going to send these dogs home. Only two of them are committed for training, but don't worry. When we get to that six or seven month old Mark, three of them will call and be like, help me. You know, (laughs) I can't do it. They were, they were doing so awesome. And now I throw the dummy and he picks it up and he just runs away with it. And man, that, if you can just prepare yourself to think it's like, you know, having a kid that makes all A's and they finally go to college and then they have to study and they flunk a class and you're like, Ooh, you know, I can't believe it. It's like they think their dog's the best dog in the world. The dog just goes through a bit of a maturity stage and they lose it for a second. You got to, you know, you got to just tighten it down. That's when you start working on formalizing obedience, you know, in, in the right way. So those can be hard things for sure. And dogs go through phases. Puppies do. They go through, um, you know, curiosity phases. They go through fear phases. Um, and people don't recognize that a lot, but you know, puppies, you know, if a dog's in a fear phase, you'll recognize if you try to do intro to gunfire and a dog that, you know, normally is super bold is a little nervous, don't write the dog off, just put it up, wait a little while and then try it again the proper way. Uh, the dog may just been in a fear phase. And so you just have to try to read your dog, look at the body language and all that stuff and then figure out where to go. So much info. I, I just love listening to you talk, to be honest. But all right, so six, we're talking kind of six to 10 months, intermediate uh, section here on Cornerstone. One of the first things is the intro to birds. So um, maybe talk about that a little bit. And where do you, where do you get your birds from? Are there any kind of laws about having frozen waterfowl? as far as bag limits and whatnot that people should be concerned about? Uh, no comment. <laughs> just <about laughs> to, yeah, there definitely is. And man, it's hard. So let me tell you, like, I'm just going to give you the easiest thing to do. Um, transfer, transfer, transfer the birds legally. If you can, you know, transfer them whole, um, clean them and electrical tape, like just, very carefully breast them. Don't pull all the feathers off. Just cut, get to the breast, de-breast the bird, if that's how you do it. And then electrical tape the bird with three rings around its center area back together really tight. Does that make sense? So like you close the bird back up and electrical tape it. Now the bird's going to be a little bit smaller and obviously weigh a little bit less, but you'll get some good usage out of that bird um, without having to use whole birds. Um, if you do use whole birds, just definitely ch- check your local laws. I mean, bag limits apply, possession limits apply to your freezer. So that's the hard part. You know, you got to be careful. Um, and you don't, you know, you don't want to, don't want to mess with that. So we try to keep, uh, and we try to eat the birds that we, that we love to eat. And if something else was shot and we're, we're, we're using it, you know, different people have different feelings on that but if we're using it for training then we will definitely try to keep a variety of species uh so that we're we're not over the limit on one species and then we'll also divide them up amongst trainers but we can make birds last a long time uh we have a bird supplier that supplies live birds for us to train with and then we'll freeze those and use those so we don't have to keep a ton of birds throughout the year we're, we, we we're able to eat uh you know train with and, and a few and then eat, eat most of them Nice. Is there Makes sense? Go ahead, Dan. You got another question? Nope. You're up. I was just thinking about that. I mean, you know, what about a guy who's, you know, just getting started or, um, you know, maybe he just doesn't get to hunt that much, but he wants to train his dog and work with his dog or whatever. And it just doesn't have access to a bunch of live birds that he can keep in the freezer or whatever. Is there, is there any kind of like, uh, you know, alternative that still accomplishes the job? Like, is there a, like an artificial version of a live duck that that the guys can get, or it's pretty much just finding a way to, to get live birds to work with kind of the only way to do it. You've got to find live birds. Um, now you can get away with, uh, like gun box supply sells wings. You can get some like dried wings that you can electrical tape onto your dummies. And that's a phenomenal way to introduce feathers. Um, but you really need to go through the whole progression of dummies, dummies with feathers, frozen birds, thawed birds, and then live birds. Um, we just did live bird intro last week with a few dogs and you got these dogs that are, they're crushing, 
doubles out to 150 yards and running short blinds, but because of the timing when they come into our program, they haven't seen a ton of live birds since they were a little bit younger and you get a live bird out. And uh, we did it with Bill Free's dog B and I put it on Instagram. The first, first three attempts were rough, man. She's <laughs> coming after it and this Mallard Drake's turn around and like hissing at her and she just running back at B hmm. and uh, Testament, this bro that raises ducks near us, his name's Chris Gulledge. He's sending like 600 ducks to hunt test this fall. He is unbelievable at raising just bold, bold bird, uh, birds. So anyway, the bees like running at the dog and then running or running at the bird and then lunging and running away from the bird, <laughs> you know, just, and <laughs> after the third time of working with it, she snatched them right up. And then we worked with them the next day. And, and on the third day, she's, you know, ground tackling on them, bringing them right to us. And the cool thing about the dogs is, you know, we're very particular about our dogs being soft mouth. So, all that ducks that'll live here and it, it sounds awful, but like they got this big pen to live in, they run around, they swim, and like once a week they get retrieved by a dog a few times and they go back in the tent. <laughs> They're totally fine. Like there's nothing wrong with them. That's hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> so what so do, are the do you clip those? Does the 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 guy that raises them he clips them so they can't fly? Um no, we we you can. Um or are they tied? You you can, but we usually electrical tape uh, the wings, and then for young dogs, we'll electrical tape the feet together because that comes off really easily because it just doesn't like duct tape will mess their wing all up. You can just pull the electrical tape off, and they're you know none the worse. Mm. They're good to go. Yes, yeah, you can clip their wings if you want. That's no big deal, but um. It's easier to keep it that way. That way, if you wanted to use live flying birds, you can just pull the tape off and they fly. Yeah, it seems it seems a lot easier. All right, so let's. Um, man, we're we're getting deep already, but uh, let's see here. So going into well, I guess the next segment is whistle stops. Whistle stop on recall. Whistle stop with a thrown dummy. Whistle stop on lining memory. Um, maybe just touch on those a little bit and, and how people can, can advance to that. Yeah. Um, whistle stop is one of those phases where people will get very frustrated. Um, and, uh, we like to do it in phases, you know, do it under control on a lead next to you until the dog is consistently stopping on the whistle. We actually, puppies learn to sit really quickly. And then once they're about to sit, we just go ahead and blow the whistle. So they get very used to hearing it. Um, the two, two things are, well, one thing is very important to remember when it comes to training dogs in this phase. And that is that distance erodes control. It's a common phrase in dog training. So the further the dog is away from you, the less control they have. And then stimulation also can erode control or is likely to. So distance and stimulation, people will try to stop their dog when it's, out actively searching for a duck or a bird or a dummy in the field. And they're like, you won't stop. And I'm like, no joke. He's far away from you. And he's stimulated. He's in the middle of task mode to get this thing. His whole life is finding it and bringing it to you. And you're trying to get him to just sit, you know, it's not going to work. So what you have to do is you have to start small and then condition the big. So you start with, you know, shorter retrieves or, or start with recall because the dog's on his way back. It's not worried about retrieving. It's not worried about running away. It's just coming straight back to you. It's looking at you, hit the whistle, put your hand up, get them sitting. We actually do a whole lot of whistle sit when they're playing. So the dog's next to you. We say the words, go play. That's a release. All of our dogs have a release. That means go do whatever the heck you want. They'll go run around for a second. When they get kind of close to you, hit that whistle. When they sit, good dog, toss the tennis ball, right? So I got a really cool uh, reward when I sat. That was neat. Um, and uh, so we go from there to big recall, then to pull push drill. And then we go to um, from pull push, we go to actually stopping the dog, like on a memory retrieve and then cold blinds. Um, and look, if the dog isn't getting it right, back up, do it again, you know, uh, start simple, just simplify and make sure the dog fully understands. Here's what I'm being asked to do. I get what I'm being asked to do. Um, before you start trying to reinforce it. You know, a lot of people, that's when they're like, I'm, you know, not to get into the whole e-collar thing, but like, I'm going to get an e-collar and teach this dog to sit. That's not going to work. You know, you can probably scare the dog into sitting, but that's not what any true trainer, even ones who use e-collars who are good trainers, that's not what they do. You teach the command, then you reinforce it. So 
Uh, make sure the dog understands what you're being, what you're asking him or her to do, and then, uh, you know, add distance and add stimulation. And when the dog fails, shorten the distance, shorten the stimulation until the dog gets better, and then go back and add distance again. Yeah, I mean, there's just it's it's amazing to me, kind of just the the undertaking that it is to to try to train you know a dog to a uh, you know, to the level of which you obviously do, but you know, I'm, I'm just looking through these, these lessons and you know, there's, I don't know, like, a, you know, a, a ton of drills and, and just um, things on directional training and, you know, memories and marking and all this stuff. And there's, there's just a ton to take in. And um, I just wonder, you know, for a guy that, um, you know, is taking this on for the first time and they're, and they're following along with cornerstone, like, is it is it realistic for them to think like, hey, you know, um, I mean, I guess I get, I'm trying to word this right. I can imagine people saying like, well, in the video, the dog is doing this. <laughs> My dog is doing that. Like, how do I fix that? You know, and do they need to? Um, is that an indication that they need to reinforce something on that particular skill set, or is it more of an indication that they're progressing too quickly? Or, um, you know, what would you say for guys that just kind of you know, reach that point where it's like, you know, I, I'm, I'm trying to shorten the distance. It's still not working. Like, do you get guys that just say they kind of like, you know, reach that point where you were talking about where they're just, they just, they want to throw in the towel and, and ship the dog back to you to train, you know, for them. But you know, for the guy that doesn't have that luxury, um, you know, what kind of, what kind of challenges or feedback have you gotten from people that are going through the, uh, the program that have kind of hit that point, you know, at this stage of the game? Yeah. Yeah. And intermediate stage is definitely where you'll hit it for sure with a lot of things, but um, what I tell people to do a couple things. Uh, first thing is break down the whole thing into steps. So, okay. Uh, I got a dog who really didn't want to recall back through water. She wanted to run around the water all the time. And I'm really working on her recalling through the water. And so I'm trying to figure out like, there's a few steps here, like coming on a straight line, getting into water or into water at an angle, stopping when I tell you to stop, like what, what, where's the breakdown occurring and how do I fix the breakdown right. and actually simplify everything as simple as possible. So if we're using, um, if we're using wingers and like ducks, like, Hey, that's a lot. Let's just go to use a little bitty dummy. If we're using a really long distance, let's just go to a really short distance with a little bit of water. Um, and simplify because people, I think, try to tackle a little bit too much at once and they make this big complex thing. Um, and, uh, it, it just, it blows up on them, you know, and then they get frustrated and they, the dog can't do it. Um, and really the best thing to do is simplify it, write it down. What are the steps of this dog sits still dog is released dog goes out. What's the dog being asked to do? At what point did the dog mess up? And like I said, 90% of the time, it's an obedience thing. Um, and uh, you can, you know, fix it if you iron out the obedience. If you just take your time, back up, simplify. I keep saying that's like I've said it a million times, but I really mean it. You're not reinventing the wheel here. Like, just keep it simple. Go work on the one component that's messed up. You know, people will have dogs that are having um, and, you know, now having uh, issues like on a cold blind and, and they're like, my dog's not running cold blinds well. And they just go out and keep running cold blinds, expecting it to get better. I'm like, which part is the dog giving you cast refusals? So you say over to the left and the dog goes straight back or you say back and the dog goes to the left. You know, is that the problem? Is the dog not sitting on the whistle? Is the dog sitting on the whistle, but not looking at you and not wanting to listen to you at all? Uh, is the dog taking the proper cast, but breaking down at 10 feet and hunting or just taking the proper cast and breaking down and going wherever they want after that. Look, identify the one or two things, identify what exactly is going on and then go find the drills that, that have to do with that, you know, find the drills that fix that. Yeah, it is. So the other day I'm running, I'm running some blinds with, uh, red and Fergus, neither one of them would cast into the wind. I'm running cold blinds into the wind and they were sucking it up. That's a hard thing for dogs to do is to take a cast straight into the wind. Very difficult uh, for some dogs, most dogs, unless you train it. Right. So the next day I went and set up a handling drill where constantly I had to cast dogs straight into the wind. 
And first few times they sucked it up, but it was simplified. They know exactly what I was asking them to do so I could reinforce it. And by the end of the day, we're casting into the wind. The next training session was much smoother. Yeah. I feel like that's a, that's something that a lot of guys would fall into in the sense that if the dog is struggling with, with something in the training program, they're, they're more likely to look at it at a macro level and say, um, you know, the dog is having trouble marking. Okay. Mm -hmm. Like what, you know, what does that mean? You know? Um, and is it a micro issue within that, that macro set of, of things that you're trying to accomplish? So I think kind of breaking it down and kind of going through the steps, like you mentioned, there would be very helpful for a lot of folks if they're, if they find themselves kind of hitting that spot where it's, you know, not, not making sense and not coming together the way that, you know, you planned it to be, because again, sort of to my point earlier about patience, you know, and knowing when the the rough spots are going to come may help you have more patience at that time. Like knowing that it's not going to go completely smooth the entire time is probably a good mindset to have and to not sort of over, you know, it's kind of one of those deals where you don't want to overreact to any, any extreme, like that day where your dog just goes out yep. and crushes it. Like your dog had a great day that day. You'll be happy about that, but no, tomorrow might be a terrible day. <laughs> and you know, for whatever reason, and, um, you know, it's going to kind of come and go like that for a while, I would assume. So uh, I think it's a good, a good yeah. way to approach it, to look at that macro thing and try to try to really n drill down and identify that, that whatever it is that's, you know, creating the issue and, and address it from that instead of just saying, uh, I got to ship the dog back to Barton cause I, I can't get the dog to Mark from, yeah. you know, simplify, simplify, figure out what's going on on a micro level, work on that man with marking is a big one, you know? Dogs, we have a dog recently that was checking up too short, and one of the trainers was really frustrated. The dog would go out 40 yards and just hunt, 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 hunt. And uh, I was like, man, we got to uh, we got to work on stretching the dog out. Quit running marks in the cover. Go to a golf course or a soccer field. Run a 150-yard mark with a big white dummy on grass that's a quarter of an inch tall. So the dog is like, oh, there it is, and just trails that whole way. You know, run marks that are uh, – 50 yards and when the dog runs out just start running backwards so when he comes back he ran 100 yards and then run it from there you know a dog already knows exactly where to go um so anyway you know simplifying those things is definitely the key when it comes to that stuff so i got you know we're we are closing in on an hour and i i know how tiring that heat can be down where you're at so i got two more questions and then uh maybe a, a story or two at the end here, but uh, how much emphasis do you put on the sit when, when you blow the whistle and your dog's supposed to sit, do you make sure that they actually sit or is that a kind of a half -y if they turn and look at you? What do you, what do you want? What do you demand out of your dogs? I don't demand sit for my personal dogs, but when a client dog wants them to sit, it's no problem. We just teach sit. Um, a lot of my dogs came from the UK where they were taught to turn and stand, which is the preferred thing over there. You'll see it in the thick of them. Um, the dogs just turn, look at you. What I do want them to do is turn and face me. A lot of times they'll like red will turn halfway and look at me and I've gotten to where now I recall them real quick, line them up. Um, so I may transfer him to more of a just sit because he's not wanting to turn all the way. But um, I don't demand my, my – at least my imports. Now, the dogs that I raise and train, like Maggie, for instance, she always turns and sits. That's the way I trained her. So it just depends on the dog. I just want them to stop and give me their entire, you know, focus. So if a dog is prone to turn real fast and then just decide on his own, I'm going left and take off, then I'll just wait them out. And if they keep doing that, I'll make them sit because it does help with that. But in the long run, in a hunting situation, it's not super helpful to have them sit, especially when you hunt a lot of water. They can't sit anyway. So, yeah, I think in that in the the very beginning of the Sitka film, Red gives you a half turn and check, and then you send him. I think doesn't he? Or pretty okay. close. Uh, do what now? Uh, in, in, in the, the Sitka, Sitka film, film like the very, very oh yeah you know, the, yeah yeah the very beginning, Red turns and looks at me, and then I cast him. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, right. All right. My second question was, and this seems to be a highly debated thing as well. Um. I guess I'm not asking so much intro to uh, swimming or playing in shallow water, but what would the age range be for actually retrieving in water? People do it. it it's it's a more um, it's more of a temperature deal. So make sure it's warm enough. I don't. I mean, I I've seen some eight week olds 
get in there. Um, and no problem at all. Now, if they don't, don't worry about it. I mean, I just got Wella swimming because I just neglected to do it. She was a house dog. I didn't want to get her dirty and all that. Um, and, you know, I just got her um, swimming. I don't know. She was like 10 months old. Um, and no big deal. She's swimming like a champ now. Big water retrieves. No issue. But for most people that are in a hurry, you're not going to do that. You know, I've got a lot of dogs on train, so I'm like looking at them like, oh, I'll do that later. <laughs> no hurry. Um, um, but for the younger dogs, I really think if you're in a place where there's some, uh, there's some like cows or anything the dog could get, I just like them to have their shot, you know, have all three rounds or four rounds of vaccination. And then, you know, let a rip tater chip, let them get in. As long as it's warm, don't do it when it's cold. They don't need to have a bad experience. So it is far better to introduce your dog into water at eight to 10 months old and warm water than to try to get a puppy to get in freezing water because you're in a hurry and it's winter time. Makes sense. So, um, my father-in-law loves, loves the podcast and he listens all the time and I'm going to share a story about water training. Uh, so he, <laughs> he goes to a boat ramp at a uh, lake by his house and he'll just throw the, throw the dominion a little bit and boo, go get it. And the one he said he threw a little bit too far, well, she still has a little bit of the, the floppy legs that just splash quite a bit. Well, she 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 was splashing and pushed the dummy out to where he thought that she wouldn't be able to get it because she just kept kicking and splashing. So he ended up about uh, neck deep in the water, <laughs> neck deep in the water, wallet and all, wallet and all. He's like, oh man. So that was a pretty funny story. But um, you know, we are we get we are getting towards the end here, and um, you know, your friend Brady Davis uh, told us to ask a couple questions and. Uh, I alluded to this before the show, but one is about a ring and one is about a, uh, your honeymoon and a funny story there. So if you want to share, this will be your time. <laughs> okay. So, <laughs> all right. I've got a ring. Everyone asks me about the ring on my right hand. Uh, and it's got my daughter's name inside of the ring and I got it as a wedding gift. I say, uh, I'm sorry, as a, we just got married two years ago, but I was like, oh, I don't know what to call that, like a birth gift? I don't even know. Like a, uh, uh, here's your, here's your baby. You helped make gift from my wife. And, uh, I, the first one I got was a little bit big and it was my first ever, um, duck season. And I went duck hunting with a guy that I'd met on his boat and, um, a buddy of mine was having a baby the same day their wife was being induced. And my wife called. She was like, you got to get home. I need to go to the hospital and check on Valerie. And anyway, I'm on the way home and I realized I don't have the ring on my hand and I definitely wore it out. And I had a Springer Spaniel with me named Ruger. And, um, man, I had my friend meet me back at the boat ramp. We hauled all the way back up the river to where I went to look for this ring. Cause I'm like, dude, I, this is my, my, I'd had it. This is like three weeks after Christmas. So I got, I'd had this ring maybe four weeks. And I'm like, man, this is like the most sentimental thing my wife has ever, um, has ever, has ever gotten me. And I lost it. And I couldn't find it anywhere. I was for sure it was going to be in the boat where I'd like taken my gloves off. And maybe it fell out in my gloves, but man, we searched everywhere. I apologized to my wife. She's like, no big deal. It wasn't that expensive orders me a new one just like it half a size smaller right comes in i'm wearing it about two and a half weeks three weeks later i'm brushing my teeth in our bathroom and we had these huge windows outside and it had rained all night the night before this is like the end of january early february like 2011 and there's this something that's just shining as the sun is hitting my backyard right onto the mirror and hitting me in the eye and so, much like Bilbo Baggins, I make my way out <laughs> into my yard, and they're sitting in a rained down, deleted pile of dog poop <laughs> is the original ring. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> so, my dog, Ruger. <laughs> <laughs> when it fell off my hand somewhere, he just lapped it up. 
<laughs> and about three and a half, four weeks later, pooped it out. And had it not rained, I would have just scooped it into the bucket and it would have been gone forever. But I still have both of them. And I call this one the one I wear, ring number one. And, of course, I call that one number two. Right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's funny. So, all right. What was the other one? Uh, your honeymoon is what Brady really wanted to hear about. Gosh. My wife's going to kill me. How many people listen to this podcast? My wife's going to kill me. My like, wife, like one I or two. You, Just my one wife or two. does not listen to HB, but it is going to get back to her <laughs> that this was talked about. Okay, so I got married years. on a Saturday night, um, and my my aunt came to the wedding and didn't even actually, she drove all the way to Texas and didn't even actually make it to the wedding because she had a severe stomach bug. We got married, uh, stayed in this really nice you know, honeymoon suite at a resort at Horseshoe Bay in Texas, flying the next morning very early out of Austin. And on the way to the airport, my wife realizes she forgot her makeup at her parents' house. So we go back. I'm going to leave a few details out for time's sake. We go back and get the makeup. And just be honest, like right after you get married, the last thing you want to do the next morning is like drive your wife to her family's house. You know what I mean? So I was like, look, I'm going to drop you off. You go get your makeup. I'm going to drive right down the street to Whataburger, get some breakfast. So I did. I picked her up. We head to the uh, we head to the, the airport. And on the way there, I was like, dude, I don't, I don't feel so good. I mean, I've been married for like nine hours, 10 hours, and I'm like, ah. I'm feeling pretty sick. And uh, we get to the airport, and, man, I've got to go. Like, I've just got to go. Run to the bathroom, you know, running like I'm holding a pencil between my crack. And, uh, <laughs> man, we get on the airplane to Dallas. I barely make it off the airplane. I'm, like, cutting off old ladies in the jetway <laughs> and running up and just dove into the bathroom, you know. Go to the bathroom <laughs> four or five times in Dallas. We get on the flight to uh, – to the Mexican resort where we were going to, I think it was Cancun or Cozumel one. And man, we're almost there. And I was like, I got to go to the bathroom. So I go up to the bathroom and I'm in there for like 20 minutes and the fastest seatbelt signs come on. We're approaching the landing and like the stewardess is knocking on the door, just like banging on it. She's like, sir, the, the captain has put on the, the fashion seatbelt. Like you can be a pilot, whatever you've, you've got to come back to your seat and put your seatbelt on. And I did the whole, like, just maybe if I ignore her, she'll quit talking. <laughs> and that didn't work. And so finally, after like her third attempt, I just said, uh, I think I said, listen, lady, the only way I'm going to buckle up is if you bring me a seatbelt in here. Oh my God. <laughs> and I'm in the back of the plane. I'm yelling. My wife's like three rows from the back. She hears this. Everyone around her is giggling, looking at her. She's really regretting this whole marriage thing. <laughs> uh, we get to our resort and sh we've got like a, a private like ca like cabin on the beach with its own like awesome porch with like a swing bed and a hot tub and, the, and like an access to the crazy river that goes to the rest of the resort. And she's like, look, I'm going to just go outside and read my book and take a nap on the, on the swing bed. And I was like, I'm going to get a shower because I need one and I'm going to sleep. So I go get a shower, I get in a, this huge king size bed in the middle of this great spot in Mexico and just go to sleep. This is where it gets a little gross guys. <laughs> so as I'm sleeping, I have this dream about me and my bros from high school. We used to hang out in the back of the parking lot with our trucks that were, you know, jacked up and had televisions on. And, uh, man, I'm sitting back there with my friends in the stream, and we're having a farting competition in my dream. And I had this moment where I was like, oh, man, you can't fart. You've got diarrhea. And I snap out of my sleep. And, boy. I have, you won the contest. I, oh, <laughs> dude! It's I'm gonna spare the details, but it basically is like someone filled up a squirt bottle with poop water and just sprayed it. <laughs> that, that's unfa uh, that's unfortunate. <laughs> yeah, it was bad. And I'm like, I'm grown. You know, I'm like, man, I haven't. I haven't pooped the bed since I was a child, like a little bitty child. And here I am, the first day of being a husband. <laughs> Get married and let yourself and go. And I have just, 
I have, for lack of better words, I have just shat my honeymoon bed. <laughs> oh, <laughs> You're just a hopeless romantic. So I had to, I had to go out. I had to, so I'm like, you know that feeling when you wake up late on like the day of an exam. That's how I was. Like my body kicked <laughs> in. Sickness is, needs to not be worried about right now because I'm into like cleaning mode, dude. I'm cleaning up the. It's on the floor. It's like I'm cleaning up oh. everything. I'm throwing the sheets just out the, the the back door to the condo. Like someone will find these and deal with it. And I got to get another shower. And I come and I open the door and Bethany looks at me. I've lit like four candles in the place. And she looks at me. She's like, "What's wrong?" And I was like, "Well, <laughs> I sharded." <laughs> and man, it was. Uh, she forgave me. You know, we're still married to this day, but you want to talk about an embarrassing poop story? I pooped my honeymoon bed. So yeah, definitely going to Mexico with a stomach issue is probably the worst thing that could possibly happen. How was the, so? How was the rest of the trip? She got sick the next night. Oh jeez! And uh, it was all oh, my we had the first three days we were both really sick, but it was a seven day trip, so the last four days we were great. <laughs> mm. Man, oh. that 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 is just un- unfortunate. <laughs> Not sure what yeah. else to say about that, but poops poop my honeymoon bed. <sighs> yeah, isn't that something? I'm not embarrassed about it anymore. I'm kind of over it. <laughs> and that well, you just had your ten ten year anniversary, right? So congrats! We did. On that. We went back to Mexico, and I held it in. There, you, redemption. The, the redemption great. tour. <laughs> there was it. The redemption cruise. Yeah. All oh, uh, water, water under the bridge at this point, right? That's it. That's <laughs> it. Well, let's not use water. Yeah, right. We'll talk about that pun, story. Pun intended. <laughs> oh, geez. As much as I've enjoyed it, we've uh, we've kept you an hour and fifteen minutes now, almost. And I know you've been uh, been working out in the four thousand uh, percent humidity today. So we're gonna we're gonna. <laughs> We're going to get you out of here, but um, we appreciate you coming on and sharing all the insight with us. And, um, you know, hopefully we'll be able to do it again and maybe get into some advanced stuff. And, um, you know, obviously encourage everyone, if you haven't had a chance yet, definitely check out Cornerstone Gundog Academy. Check out Southern Oak Kennels. Check out uh, the Bad Grammar Academy. All great stuff going on that uh, Barton's associated with. And uh, we appreciate his support of the show and uh, for giving us some time this evening. Uh, Dan, you got anything else you want to run by Barton here before we go? No, you know, I mean, being on social media quite a bit, um, you hear people talking about Cornerstone, and I think a lot, probably like 90%, I'm talking the people that don't have it, 90, 95% do not understand the amount of information in that program and actual step-by-step that you can go through. You set up your daily programs to do what you want to accomplish, and... You know, I'm seeing it firsthand with with my father in law and Boo and and everything that he's getting done with her, and she's still so young, and it's just it's blowing my mind. So, um, you know, there is a a free a free few modules that you can get in there, a little test test run that you can do. So, I would say go and do that and see. Just go and see the the platform and how it's set up, and really, if you want to train a dog, you need to go and check it out. So. I think that's about that's about all I have to say about it. But it really is it, it's really incredible, and the the amount of I don't want to call it fake news, but just the amount of ignorance and people that don't know what what it entails. Um, just trying to help correct correct that. So that's okay, all. I, man, that's all I, want to I say. appreciate it. I appreciate yep. it. Awesome. Well. Uh, if you guys uh, hope you guys have a great night. Thank you guys for having me on again. Thanks for the kind words about Cornerstone, and uh, I am uh, and always I excited say, to be with you guys on the show. There is uh, our hundredth giveaway that uh, I know we'll talk about this as we um, do our little exit, but there is a Cornerstone program in the giveaway, so make sure you sign up. I think every one of your companies has something in there. So, uh, Bad Grammar Academy membership, and uh, uh, yeah, yeah, that's, that's okay. okay. It's the best so. giveaway in the history of of waterfowl giveaways. So, <laughs> I'm uh, I'm excited for you guys. That's awesome. 
awesome. Secretly, I know I don't need to win, but boy, I'd love to win. <laughs> <laughs> okay, don't give me the Cornerstone membership. I'll take the rest. Of yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> so. All right. Well, definitely some good stuff. Appreciate the time again, sir. I encourage everybody to check out all your stuff you got going on, and uh, we'll do it again soon. Likewise, guys. Thanks. Have a great night. Talk to you soon. You bet. Well, there you have it. And I uh, appreciate Barton coming on the show. Always always brings it when he comes on. And um, you know, I think we covered a lot of good material there. Got a couple laughs there at the end, which is cool. And, um, yeah, looking forward to having on him again uh, in the future and talking talking some more advanced stuff. Yeah, without a doubt, that'll be a great one. A lot of a lot of people looking forward to that. But uh, you know, we we thank Barton for his support of the show, and um, maybe give a little update on the hundredth episode. Five weeks away now. Yeah, we are. We're 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 coming down. I mean, five weeks comes by. You know, goes by in no time. So we'll we're going to be pulling these winners here uh, before too long. And you know what I'll say is that. There's definitely interest. I mean, people are definitely signing up and, you know, someone I saw in the group today talking about, you know, how unlikely it is for them to win and whatever. And sometimes I don't want to know, but I can promise you this, if you don't enter, you're not going to win. <laughs> so, you know, got nothing to lose, give it a shot and, um, you know, see what happens. But, uh, yeah, a lot of people, a lot of people put in, a lot of people taking advantage of those extra entries, um, you know, simple button clicks and stuff, man, you need get, get, get that much more chance to, to get in on it. So, uh, I'm seeing a lot of names that I recognize that have a lot of entries in this. So, um, yeah, we'll see what happens. Yeah. Some, some people definitely getting after it. So yeah, like you said, this is, um, we're recording on Tuesday night. This will come out next Monday and something to, if you're not following us on social media, follow us because we'll give updates and, when we update companies that join this giveaway, you can go in and get extra entries. So, Gundog Outdoors, Alex Langbell, is giving away one of his dog safety systems, and we will be updating that here shortly. But by the time you listen to this, it'll already be up. Also, Heavy Shot is coming in with a case of shells, so you can also get extra entries there. Yep. But like I said, people are already going to know about it. Because we have a little less than a week before this show comes out, but nonetheless, there will be there probably will be more added as well. But that is definitely getting close to getting shut down. So yeah. I don't know if we should put a limit, maybe forty forty winners. It's a lot of organization, especially once we call call not call them, but pull the winners and and all the contacting and shipping and and everything that goes into it. So yeah, but just already huge. Yeah. 16 over 16,000 closer to 17. And, uh, it's been fun. It's been fun on this end. And, you know, I think the, the companies are getting a lot out of it as well as, you know, the listeners, they're going to be getting a lot as well. So all good stuff, all good stuff. Yep. And we've had people reaching out to us and, you know, confirming that their entries are in and everything. And, you know, that's been all good. And hopefully last episode was, was helpful and, um, you know, took a lot of the, uh, you know, a lot of the, the questions out of it, but if you've got questions, definitely hit us up and uh, we'll, we'll get you squared away. And, um, yeah. you know, I'm just like, I'm, there were, <laughs> there were some that, that messaged and had incorrect email addresses. Yep. I mean, so. it happens, man. I'm telling you. That's what I was saying. They they forgot an E. Yep. And it happens. Double double check your stuff, man. No doubt. Don't don't miss out. You go through all the you go through all the time and effort to put it in there and sign up. Make sure you, you get it right. And um it's just funny. I I, I I I we just can't escape David Vandekamp. I mean, I'm looking at this entries list and I see his name right there. And I mean, <laughs> he got just incredible run on tonight's episode. So uh <laughs> I can only imagine what will come of this. <laughs> well, you know what? He was, he, uh, he had Monday off with, with Tex and he said he was driving with his kids and his kids were like, 
just blown away that we're talking about him and and Texas, their new black lab puppy. So he said it was super cool to see the the look on their faces when we started talking about them. So oh well, they're gonna love this episode. Jeez, oh man. Yeah, Vandy, you get called out a bunch, but you're yeah. well, you're welcome. All good stuff. <laughs> your kids, your kids are looking <laughs> up to you too. <laughs> Um, anyway, what else you got? One more thing before we, uh, before we close this guy down. I don't know, man, just getting stuff in order and, um, you know, figuring out plans and hunts and it's just really close to the fun time of year. I mean, what is today? The seventh or so. So 20 some days until we're together and putting some sky pandas on the ground. Yeah. Pretty pumped. Yep, it's probably about time for you to start scouting and finding us a good honey hole. Yep, on it. <laughs> I'll, ban- I'll band. We got them lined up. I'll banded, please. Got them lined up. So we're ready to go. We'll be ready. Cool. And uh, oh, also, our uh, our Delta chapter. Um, there's a new guy running the game commission around here, and he's very willing to work with. Um, our chapter, which is super cool and really different than the last guy. So, um, you know, we, we have put together a lot of wood duck boxes, which obviously it's too late this year, but, you know, getting in on, on the state parks and stuff next year, um, will be much simpler hen houses, not a ton of, of, uh, nesting mallards around here, but we will do our part for any that choose to do so. And, uh, more recently, they're doing duck banding like right now. So nice. They went out they went out and set traps yesterday. Or maybe maybe it was today here Tuesday and next week when people are listening to this, we will be setting up our schedule to go out and actually do some banding. So hopefully I get in on that, get some photography work in and and show that to the listeners. Yeah. That's cool. That's all. Banding is also a really fun thing for kids to do because they get to see the ducks up close and kind of touch them a little bit and stuff like that. So I'm sure that'll be a good opportunity if, uh, if not just your kids are interested, but you know, any kids, uh, kind of around the chapter and hopefully get a shot to do some of that stuff. Yeah. That'd be fun. Cool. Fun to be part of. Yeah. And it's, it's just, it's cool that we have someone over there that's willing to allow us to do some more work. You know what I mean? Like it's, it's kind of been like, no, don't, it's not a step on our toes because they really didn't do that much in that regards. But now we get to help and, and really, you know, push the conf- conservation side of things. So I'm really excited about that. Yeah, no, that's good stuff. Glad to hear it and glad to hear you're getting involved. And, um, you know, just a good example of a little extra time, you know, with your local chapter, get you a lot of great opportunities and get a chance to do cool stuff. So if you've been on the fence, you know, no time like the present, jump in, reach out to somebody, locally or uh, even you know i know a lot of these groups if you send a you know an email or reach out to them via their website they can point you in the right direction of who's kind of running your local area and you can get with them and and get in get involved so all good stuff oh one more thing of course (laughs) (laughs) so the giveaways that we do we do weekly giveaways for the show mostly run through our our listeners group on facebook and we tried to do a live show and I just turned into a, a a bunch of blocks and it was locking up. It looks like we were having a staring contest. So I called my, I called Windstream, the internet provider today, and I was eligible for a free upgrade. So when I, when I got the, the DSL hookup, it was like the first line through the system and I never checked to see if they upgraded. So I got the, the highest that they initially started with, which is very slow. And everything is, well, my download speed is tripling and my upload speed is timesing by eight, essentially. So I'll be able to do live videos and not turn into a bunch of little baby blocks and blurriness. What did you say you're getting for your upload speed? It's like 1.5. And what's it going to go to? Eight. Which isn't bad. No? It's not it's not great, but I, I think just, to do like a, I just face, tested, a Facebook Live, you need like three. I just tested mine while we were talking, and my upload speed is fifty eight point five megabytes per second. Upload. Well, I will be at <laughs> one six. I'll be at one sixth of what your speed is. But anyway, I think it takes like three to run a, a Facebook Live, three to four. 
somewhere around there. So I'll, I'll be I'll be golden. That's all I need. Well, but that's the high, it's the highest thing that they have here. I'm out in the boonies. Yeah, you're not wrong. All right. Well, I mean, it's, so now that people have got your internet update, before I wrap this up, I want to make sure to take a minute to thank Lucky Duck, Gunner Kennels, The Bad Grammar Academy, Camp Chef, Black Rifle Coffee Company, Native Eyewear, Mount Airy Waterfowl Club, Warsaw, Virginia, and Cornerstone Gun Dog Academy. Thank you to all of those great companies for supporting our show. And again, we encourage you to support them in any way that you can. So, all right, Dan, I'm not giving you one more chance. I'm just going to go ahead and wrap up now. All right, that does it for episode 95 of the HP Outdoors Waterfowl Podcast. Check us out on iTunes if you're getting caught up on all the past episodes. While you're there, you can leave us a five-star rating and review. You can always head over to hpoutdoors.com, find all the past episodes, get the link to sign up for the giveaway, and all kinds of other good stuff there. Um, We're coming back to you next week with a brand new show, new content, and new stories from Dan and myself. So until then, take care. Take care.